I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc. Listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome to the Goddard Report. Comments made on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is White Rock City Councilor David Chesney. After a summer break, he's back to holding his community meetings at the White Rock Library. How was it last Saturday? It was wonderful, Jim. It's always uh, nice to get back and and sit down. And uh, We had a bunch of new people coming out. Depending on where the the hot button developments are popping up, uh, people tend to, I think, somewhat out of desperation, they're like, "What can I do? I, I I've got to do something." And uh, it, we see that here, and I'm sure it happens everywhere. People see there's development happening all over the area, and they don't much care about it till all of a sudden one pops up in their neighborhood. Then they're screaming, going, "How could this happen?" And it's like, "Well, not to be negative, but this has been going on for months, years in White Rock, and..." Now that it's in your backyard, I understand why you feel it's paramount. So always nice to see new people coming out. Um, uh, yeah, the exchange was, was, was very interesting. You know, again, trying to, uh, as I've said before, I, I, I don't want these to turn into negative bitch sessions. Um, you know, I don't want to set myself up as a pinata uh, that people can just come and whack with a stick for an hour and a half and go home. I understand their frustration, but... You know, we uh, we we develop uh, a pretty good uh, uh, decorum uh, for the meetings, and uh, to that extent, it was a great meeting on Saturday. Any time that we can bring the community together, and and more and more, I try to encourage not just talking to me, in amongst themselves, and uh, we can all share ideas. So it was a great day. Was redevelopment the hot topic? It will always be the redevelopment. Uh, will always be the hot topic. White Rock, to be very honest with you. Plain and simple facts are is that there are a lot of developers that, given the proximity to the ocean uh, and the spectacular ocean views that can be afforded it, uh, the developers are at at the gates. And I don't blame developers, uh, but I just wish that we uh, could maintain a uh, a quorum on council that says we have a designated town center where the d- density and the high rises are to go when that area is built out. Then we will look at expanding it, but not until then. But right now we've got this, as I've referred to it, a giant game of whack-a-mole, high-rises popping up all over the top of the uh, hilltop, and, and the people living in the areas are going like, oh, my God, how did this happen? Well, unfortunately, the only sure way that you can make any uh, positive changes is the election in 2018. But in the meantime, they should never give up, and mobilizing and getting their neighbors together. There's public hearings this week. Uh, there'll probably be three, four, five hundred people will, you know, come through the community center and the council will be sitting at the front and people will be allowed to speak for and against the development. And, of course, if the council, the majority of council passes it, uh, people go, well, why bother? Uh, they never listen to what we say. Well, you know, I, I know their frustration. I know where it lives, where it, where it breeds from. But you can never give up. You you just need to stay out there and and continue to work diligently. People have spent half a million, three quarters of a million dollars, moved into a nice, quiet neighborhood, forests around their development, and all of a sudden, a development proposal sign goes up, and they find out that some the, the developer wants to drop a 12-story tower in, 25 feet away from their deck. I'd be mad too. Right, and does White Rock have a bylaw that asks people to retain the forest, as much forest as they can when they do develop? Well, we don't have a lot left here, to be be very honest. We have a tree bylaw, a tree policy, and we are trying to do everything we possibly can to mitigate the wiping out of the trees. We've got, uh, you know, across the border, across 16th Avenue, South Surrey is the fastest growing area in Canada, and massive, massive forests are being just completely stripped away uh, to make room for new subdivisions. So 
you know, we we don't have a lot of forest in White Rock, to be very honest. Uh, but we we are trying to protect every tree we possibly can. Do you have a view by law? In the sense of what? Well, if you block somebody's view, do you have view corridors? Vancouver tried to maintain that. I don't know if they've done a very good job of it. No, no, there's the, your, your view is not guaranteed by any stretch of the imagination. Because uh, I did cover a lawsuit from a person who bought a condo on False Creek where their view was guaranteed, and a year later they built a 25-story tower in front of his three-story uh, townhouse. And he won, by the way, because they told him the view is guaranteed. Well, yeah. Uh, again, I, I'd, I'd be I'd be very dis, very upset if if I had, especially if you had it in writing that your view was guaranteed. <clears throat> we try to encourage uh, people, you know, when planting trees and that to to try to you know secure some form of tree that is is not going to grow sixty, seventy, eighty feet tall. Uh, but there again, it's up to each individual what they want to do on their property. If somebody wants to have a big Douglas fir tree in their yard, they're more than, you know, able to go and plant one. Does the city ask developers to give them so much money so they can build more parks or improve other amenities in the city? Well, every, every community has that. They're called CDCs. And, uh, yeah, for, a, you know, a major development, the one that we'll be dealing with Thursday night, if it gets the green light, uh, $3.6 million into the city's coffers. But it can't be, it has to be used for very specific items, beautification, uh, community centers, uh, playhouse, uh, an amenity that all of the community will be able to benefit from. So, you know, uh, development on, uh, in that sense brings in a lot of cash to the city, to every city. Uh, but, you know, again, you have to be very careful about, you know, you, you don't want to appear that, uh, you know, you're you're approving that development just to get your hands on some money. That just sends the wrong message. Well, that's the conundrum that Burnaby's in. They're allowing small three-story walk-ups to be destroyed to be turned into monster towers. The city gets a lot of money from it. But in the meantime, what do you do with the people who had affordable housing who can't afford to buy a $800,000 suite? Yeah. Well, I think that's happening everywhere. We see it happening here in White Rock. Um you know, one third of our population lives in the up, uptown area here in what would be termed as three story 70, uh, 1970 apartments that have now morphed into, uh, fully owned condominiums. But, uh, you know, as these come down, uh, and they will eventually come down if the growth continues. The difference with White Rock though is what I'm seeing is it's still very much a retirement community. That's what sells. Uh, there's a development across the road from where I live that's a 12-story, very high-end, all-cement building. Suite started at three-quarters of a million dollars and rapidly went up to a couple of million dollars. Um, you know, all the amenities, a health spa in the basement, a, a lap pool, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful building. Uh, it sold out very quickly. Conversely, some of the other towers they've built, small suites, not really the type of thing, you know, mom and dad sell the great big beautiful house for two, three, four million dollars. They want to downsize, but they don't want to downsize to a 700 square foot apartment. Right. They're still used to having some elbow space. Yeah. And, you know, they, you know, the, the ones that are selling here appear to me to be doing exactly that. They're, they're appearing to, uh, appealing to people that are, are selling and want to downsize, but they still want some luxury. Do people have any alternative ideas to these multi-story developments? Well, uh, you know, we've had some developments. Uh, there's a development down the road here on Thrift Avenue that, you know, it's a lot of beautiful will, uh, wood siding set back from the road, sort of in a horseshoe, beautifully designed building. And, you know, almost without exception, everybody that I've talked to in White Rock has said, wow, what a beautiful development. I could live with a bunch of those popped up all over town. But, you know, the, the developers, they want to go for the height. That's where the money is. Any thought about trying to contour those things down a hillside instead of putting them right up top? The high rises? Yes. In, in, so you build it up in steps so it's not sticking above everybody else behind it. 
Well, that's, that was the original idea, and that's why the town center uh, in the official community plan that was created back in 2008 had a very uh, specific area where the height would go that it wouldn't, it wouldn't block anybody's views, to be very honest. But as I say, the developers are looking to uh, come before council and ask for uh, amendments to the OCP, allowing them to build uh, where there was never any densification approved. And in a lot of cases, they're getting it because the majority of our council, like most councils in the lower mainland, are fully funded uh, by developers. Isn't there a conflict of interest there? Funny you should say that because that's what I would have thought, Jim, and absolutely there is no conflict of interest. The community charter, which governs civic government, absolutely does not uh, have any wording that would state that you're in a conflict of interest. Silly me, I thought for sure, if I take money from a developer, which I would never do, but I thought, well, if, if Jim Goddard Development gives me $20,000 for my campaign and Jim Goddard comes looking for an approval, one would think I should have to say, excuse me, but I'm going to have to step outside of the room. I would be in a conflict of interest. I've taken $20,000 from Goddard Development. Not the case. Really? Yep. Now, now I'm shocked at that. Yes. Most people are when they hear it. Should there be a bylaw that says you have to do it, or is this a provincial law? No, it it could be it could be passed uh, uh, by at the civic level. Does the province have any legislation about that? No. Of course, we have a premier who has private dinners with people for twenty five grand, and she doesn't feel that's a conflict of interest in Quebec. That would be called collusion and corruption, and she could be charged. Yeah. Of course, in Quebec, how much corruption is that stopped? <laughs> <laughs> They've given it a whole new name. Yes, they have. We'll be back with David Chesney right after the break. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. In Goddard, we trust. Welcome back. We're speaking with David Chesney. David, anything else besides development in White Rock come up at your community meeting on Saturday? Uh, no, that was that was the main thing. There, there was uh, a little talk about uh, you know the railway on the waterfront will will constantly be uh, a source of concern for people that have moved here recently or feel that we have seen an increase in the. Uh, blowing of the train whistles as they travel through town. We've had too many people hit on our train tracks, and I don't know what the answer is. I'd hate to see us have to fence off that whole property uh, because then the beach access would be non-existent if it would be an SF, which is the rail line here, did in Bellingham. They had an area where people were constantly cutting across the tracks, so they put up 12-foot black mesh fences. Problem solved. So either either we do something to address this problem or we're going to continue to have the trains coming through here and blowing the horns. People, of course, uh, feel that, you know, that the, the, the horns are unnecessary. But by law and by Transport Canada, if, if they come to a level crossing, which we have one, two, three, five of them, uh, because there are no uh, lights uh, except for at the one at the pier, and no arms that come down, uh, or pardon me, the other ones, they do have uh, the bells and, and uh, uh, lights, but because no arms come down, it's by law that the train must sound its whistle. Well, it doesn't sound like installing arms would be that expensive. No. Well, you know what? It never ceases to amaze me, the staggering cost. You would think, you know, a couple of two-by-fours, some bolts, uh, you know, I'm, I'm being somewhat facetious, but... It, it would run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars, unfortunately. Uh, but it's something we may have to take a look at. Uh, I think the city, under the current leadership of our mayor, uh, is reticent to spend any more money and that he's campaigned far and wide that he wants to have that rail line moved off of here. I tend to disagree that that's ever going to happen. That's my opinion. I'm entitled to it. 
Uh, the mayor feels uh, confident that it could happen someday, but, you know, it would be hundreds of millions of dollars to relocate that rail line, and then we're going to run it right through someone else's neighborhood. They're not going to be too happy up in Surrey when that happens. And, of course, rail is the most efficient way to use, you know, move goods. You have to admit that. So why not make it part of those developer packages that the money's going to go to either put an overpass, underpass, or a guarded crossing in, and you'd have your problem solved? Uh, we can't spend money on, on a rail line. That's not our rail line. So it's up to the railway to do it, even if you gave them the money? I, we, I, I don't think we can give them the money legally. We, we did put in some, some new crossings at our cost, uh, but as far as, uh, you know, directly paying the money to the BNSF, no, we couldn't do that. Well, again, the law sometimes is insanely stupid because it's an obvious solution for everybody. David, you also came back from the Union of BC Municipalities meeting in Victoria. A thousand mayors and city councillors getting together to chat about what? Well, there was a handbook. Uh, there was hundreds of resolutions. Uh, any community uh, can put forward a resolution. Um, you know, whatever, whatever is a hot topic. And these are these are voted on on mass. Um, you know, resolutions passed uh, do not mean that the law is going to change. It means that, you know, quite often these are uh, levels of government, up, you know, recommending to the provincial and the federal government that we would like to see changes in the way some of the things are done. Some of them are just, you know, minor, minor dressing things, uh, you know, uh, putting forth a resolution that uh, we should open up our UBCM to John Q. Public. Well, that was resoundingly voted down. But it was endorsed to invite uh, representatives from First Nations. They should be at the table, anyways. I don't know how we've gone, on, how they've gone on this long, without members of uh, the First Nations in British Columbia being at the table when we're talking about the future of the province of British Columbia. Are they at the table now? No, there was a resolution passed uh, that uh, we will extend an invitation. Well, yes, that's the right thing to do, and you're absolutely right. It's incredible. And who's been complaining for a 100 years that they're never consulted? Yeah. And we've had so many court cases saying they have to be, and so at least now municipalities in B.C. believe that. Uh, one resolution that they passed in 2013 was that local fire chiefs should be able to call in the Mars water bomber to deal with interface fires, uh, passed almost unanimously, and the province has ignored that as well. They parked the Mars during the entire forest fire season here. It wasn't even used in Fort McMurray under the lie, oh, there's no suitable water source. The plane's got a 3,000-mile range. I'm yeah. sure with uh, the lesser Great Lakes of Canada right next door, they could have found a drop of water t or two to scoop up. So there's one of the world's best firefighting resources left sitting on a lake. Its only duty was to appear at the Oshkosh uh, air show this year. That's where people bring in experimental aircraft. It's 700,000 of your closest friends attending. Anyway. But well, what so, you've clearly indicated is yes, resolutions can be passed, but it does, it's, they're, they're not uh, immediately en enacted into law. Do they ever pay attention to them? I know the premier always speaks at the conference. I want to hear your concerns, but does she listen to them? Uh, I suppose in an election year, as we're faced right now, she'll listen a little more. But it's not a and a I mean, yes, the resolutions from the UBCM certainly will land on the Premier's desk, and I assume every MLA's desk, so that they'll know in their communities what resolutions were passed and which were advocated by their communities. But um, we'll have to see. As I say, there weren't really any major ground breaking i didn't i didn't you know i wasn't there for every resolution vote i was there for the vast majority of them but a lot of it is just kind of window cleaning you know straightening up the shop uh you know golden might have a problem and trail might have a problem so they put it forward and as long as it's not going to impact your community negatively you know the resolution is passed but then of course enacting it is a whole other matter is there a sense of frustration there that their resolutions are rarely acted on? You know, I, I can't really get a reading on that. This is only the second UBCM that I've attended. Um, 
after I went to the first one, I kind of thought, okay, don't be too critical. Uh, you know, get another one under your belt. And, and I still don't want to appear to be critical, but, you know, just generally the topics that were, were dealt with and talked about, um, I think we could have, they could have been a little bit more topical and current, but again, a lot of these, you know, a big convention this size is put together six months, nine months out. So some of the things that are hot buttons today, uh, six or nine months ago, uh, weren't on the hot button list. So I, I don't know. It's very difficult. I find the most, uh, uh, gratifying and productive part of these is kind of the breakout sessions at lunch or dinner when you end up sitting down at a table with eight councillors and mayors from various other regions. There's a, 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 some very good dialogue occurs there, but I don't need, I don't know that I need to have the taxpayers of White Rock, uh, put me up in the Empress Hotel for five nights to be able to accomplish that. Right. You could just invite people over for dinner yourself. Yeah. Well, for members of the media, I can say, the best part of the thing is all the hospitality suites that they have where you can just cruise from one to the other with free food and drink. Yeah, it seems to me if you uh, tell any tell anybody that the Premier is going to be speaking or there's free booze and food, they'll be there. Well, that's the Canadian way, isn't it? <laughs> I guess it is. Is there anything that you would like to see this thing accomplish? What should they have been talking about? Well, I think we should have been dealing, uh, you know, with marijuana dispensaries. The medical marijuana uh, issue is totally resolved, despite some communities and some mayors and councillors still digging their heels in on that. But we know that the, as opposed to, you know, I think we should have made some, and there were, there were a couple of resolutions. So there are kind of out in front of it, but I think we should have been discussing it much further so that we're sending a clear message up to the province and to the feds before the imminent legalization of marijuana, uh, we want to be able to have some input as opposed to them sort of jackbooting in and telling us how it's going to be. The resolutions were basically saying, hey, there's going to be a lot of money flowing around. If these dispensaries are in our communities, we expect that we should be getting a taste of the pie too. So, <clears throat> again, that's a resolution that was passed unanimously, and we'll go to the feds and they'll they'll decide whether or not we're going to get any of that money. Well, plus, you want to be careful. Don't forget, it's not going to be just medical dispensaries. This is going to be legal like a bar. Well, exactly. And uh, have you looked at Washington and Oregon states where they have legal pot, what kind of problems they might have had, and, and what kind of benefits? Well, I keep a pretty close eye on Washington and their problem, and it was only natural. They They had to know that this was how are they going to deem whether or not a person high on marijuana I think we would all concur they are impaired, but to what level? That's the difficult thing that they're wrestling with. That seems to be the the one and only downside that I've heard. The upside is they're building schools and hospitals and uh, improving their infrastructure left, right, and center because of all the millions of dollars that are now flowing into the coffers, which is exactly what's going to happen in Canada. Right, and when you legalize drugs... You take the money out of the hands of organized crime and put it where it should be, in the hands of citizens. Yeah. You're not going to get rid of it. You might as well get the financial benefit. Well, exactly. Prohibition should have taught us that lesson. Well, it still hasn't. <laughs> no, and, you know, uh, I mean, on numerous occasions when I've seen members of organized crime groups flip and start testifying, they all seemingly have one common thread, and that is that Roughly 80% of their income is generated from marijuana sales. Sure, they're into other things, loan sharking, whatever, cocaine sales, stolen cars. I don't know. The, the, it's a long list of other sources of revenue. But marijuana has always been their huge cash crop. And that's the same what happened in Prohibition. When you outlawed booze, all the gangsters made money and the government didn't. So they, the government went, well, this isn't working. The gangs didn't go away, but they had less money, so it was less lucrative, and less people became gangsters. Right, and of course, here's the ironic thing. The more you crack down on drugs, the more expensive they become, and the more lucrative it is to become a gang member. Yep. <laughs> David, always a pleasure chatting with you, and we'll talk to you from one month's time from now. Thank you very much, James, and before I go, I'd just like to say everyone and anyone that's listening, uh, please... 
don't wait for your counselors to set up a community conversation. Send them an email. Put a phone call into them and ask them to set something up, or at the very least, ask them if they can meet them for a coffee. We're public servants, we're civil servants, and they owe it to you. And build for the future. Don't ever give up. David, if somebody wanted to contact you about these meetings or any issue we've talked about, is there an email? Yeah, they could send me an email, uh, editor at whiterocksun.com. Thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thank you, James. We'll talk to you. I look forward to it in a month. My guest has been White Rock City Councillor David Chesney. Questions for the show can be sent to info at howstreet.com. Check out our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on the Goddard Report and talkdigitalnetwork.com are an expression of opinion only. The Goddard Report is available online and mobile at talkdigitalnetwork.com. The Goddard Report is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.